Hey everyone, this is Charles here from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. Many of you will be familiar with the well-known 6SN7 family of tubes, and their many variations. And last week, we had a look at an early single triode called the 76. Here's a beautiful example of one made by Sylvania. And of course, it came in an absolutely beautiful box. I haven't heard any complaints about showing these off, so I'm going to keep doing it because I think they're just absolutely wonderful. So today, on Tube Lab number 96, we're going to look at a little bit of tryout history and show you that these two tubes are more similar than you might think on a first impression. But first, caution everyone. Electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them, and always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, so let's talk first about the one thing that these two tubes still have in common. They're both general purpose triodes. What does a general purpose, or sorry, what does general purpose mean? Well, Obviously, they can be used for audio amplification, or we wouldn't be that interested in them. But they can also do other things, like phase inverting, oscillating, and being a deflection amplifier. So these tubes were capable of running in a wide array of circuits and being used for many different applications. So it's no surprise that we can see a history of general purpose triodes being developed and used across the tube eras. What's different about these two tubes, and how did something like this, the 76, turn into something like this, the 6SN7? Well, it happened over several different steps. Let's start at the 6SN7 and work our way backwards. So what do we have here? Well. Considering the amount of variations of 6SN7s out there, you might be forgiven for thinking this is one. You might also be forgiven for thinking this is a 12SN, oh, sorry, not a 12SN, a 6SL7, but it's not. This is a 6AH7. It's another general purpose dual triode made around the same time as the 6SN7GT. And in fact, it has very similar specs to it. Let's take a quick look at those. So, let's grab my pointer here. Here, we have a tongue saw spec sheet for the 6SN7GT. Now keep in mind, this is the earliest version of the 6SN7, so it's going to have different ratings than the later GTA and GTB2s. And you can see, with a plate voltage of 250 volts, which is very common, we get an amplification factor of 20 and 9 milliamps of current. If we take a look at the Kenrad 6AH7GT spec sheet, we're going to see something very similar. 250 volts in the plate gets us an amplification factor of 16, so a little lower than 20, and 12 milliamps of current, so a little bit higher. That means that these tubes can run in similar uh, circuits. But there is one major difference. The 6AH7 has a different pinout than the 6SN7. So you can't plug it into a socket meant for a 6SN7. It's just not going to work. You're probably going to end up blowing up something. So you really don't want to do that. However, we do have a tube that you can use. Oh ho ho! Another Loctal. Okay. I don't know if you guys are getting tired yet of my Loctal obsession. I know I'm crazy about them. I'm not going to subject you to my obsession for too long. But, if you look at that, those plates look very similar. And just like how the 6SN7 has a Loctal equivalent with the 7N7, the 6AH7 has the Loctal equivalent of the 7AF7. 
This is the 12 volt version. So instead of 7 AF7, it's 14 AF7. And Sylvania did that because with the naming conventions of octal tubes, they would typically put the voltage first. So 6SN7 is a 6 volt heater. If Sylvania wanted to keep that same standard with their octal tubes, there would have been a lot of conflicts. So a good example is how Sylvania ended up calling their octal version the 7N7. If they instead chose 6N7, that would have conflicted with another tube that was on an octal base called the 6N7. So they added a volt to the heaters, uh, at least in, in the spec sheet, not in reality. So a 7N7 says that it works on a nominal 7 volts. However, it's still using the same filament as the 6SN7s, and likewise the 14 AF7s are 12 volt tubes. So that's why they name them that way. These tubes are really interesting because we can actually play these in a modern amp, or at least our modern amp, the universal. The reason for that is that Sylvania whenever they were designing the Loctals, took all the dual triodes and standardized them on this pinout pattern. Where a 6SN7 doesn't have a mirrored set of pins, all the Loctal double triodes do. So you end up with two heaters on either side of the, um, of the positioning pin, and then on each side you have a cathode, a plate, also called an anode, and your grids. So the 6SN7, oh sorry, I guess the 7N7, the 7F7, and the 7AF7, and all their 12 volt versions will work with the same adapter. And it will bring all those pins to the correct ones if you're plugging them into a 6SN7 circuit, like our universal preamp. The other reason why these tubes are interesting is because we're now using them in the development of our GU50 monoblock amplifier. This is going to be the driver stage. We've listened to them in the universal and they sound great and the slightly lower amplification factor isn't a problem with them. Okay, so let's put this aside here for now. And let's bring back out 6AH7. So, like the 6SN7 that has two triodes in one bottle, the 6AH7 was developed off of a similar tube. The 6SN7 was developed off the 6J5. You can see that similar plate right there. While the 6AH7 was developed off the 6P5GT. Isn't that interesting? The plates do look a little bit different, and this tube, the newer one, is actually slightly higher spec than this. But why this tube is interesting is because it's a transitional tube between the 76 and the AH7. If you look at this compared to the 76 tube, oh, the plates are identical, you know, except for the coating on them. But if you look at the spec sheets for these tubes, they operate exactly the same. Different pinout, clearly, different base, but this tube was used so much and for so long that they decided to make an octal version of it, and that became the 6P5G. Before the 76, there were actually other tubes that were very similar. The 76 replaced a tube called the, oh, let me see here, the 56. Yeah, that's correct. The 56 was very similar, slightly lower spec, so this did improve on it. However, it used a 2.5 volt heater, which was much more common at the time. And the 56 replaced the 27, which used that same 2.5 volt heater. It was all the same pinouts and actually the same pinout as this guy here too, on that five pin base. However, the 27 used over twice the current of the 56. 
So at each iteration, they've improved the heaters on them. The 27 um, used a lot of current, the 56 used less current at the same voltage, and then the 76 used even less current at a slightly higher voltage of 6 volts. So why is the 76 interesting? Well, it's kind of in a transitory period of tubes where it's still a vintage old triode, but it doesn't have a lot of the drawbacks that one of these old triodes would have. You see, before the five pin bases, it was fairly common to see directly heated cathodes where the heaters and the cathodes were combined. You see that a lot with four pin tubes. Uh, obviously, they didn't have enough pins to, uh, to run them out separately. And I think it had a lot to do also with the technology of the time and how these things were being wired. But in a modern circuit, that's a pain to work with. Um, it, it's really not fun to try and have your cathode and your heater on the same set of pins. So having them separate, like in the 76, is really convenient for us. At the same time, too, we know it has this wonderful history of being related to good sounding tubes. So this gives us about the oldest version of this triode that we can reasonably work with in a nice little bottle with a base that we can still get and make. So this is a tube that we're very interested in and that we're playing around with. And it's just, it's really nice. After the 12AH7, we get other dual triodes, most notably the 12AU7, a much more modern 9-pin miniature tube, which is a direct descendant of tubes like this and the 6SN7. So these kinds of general purpose dual triodes have really stuck around for a long time. Okay, so why does any of this matter? Well, I'll try not to knock a tube off here. You know, you'll see that I, I listened to your advice and I got myself a nice little mat to put down. So we're not gonna have tubes rolling everywhere, but you know, gesturing, I'm gonna knock, try not to knock them away. Well, so why does it, any of this matter? Well, if you find a tube that you like, like the 6SN7, it's pretty likely that the earlier versions of the tube are going to sound good as well. And while I'm still developing my ears for this, Dad has found consistently that he prefers the sound of older triodes. And you see that opinion shared by quite a number of people. So if you walk up to the tube family tree and you shake your favorite branch, you might just find a bunch of interesting tubes fall out and tempt you into a listen. Oh, um, speaking of Dad, you of course all know him by James or Jim. That just sounds too formal to me, and I didn't find it rolling off the tongue while shooting these videos. He suggested I refer to him as PAD, <laughs> or Partner and Dad, for, uh, or a shortened version of Partner and Dad, <laughs> but I think that's worse. So you'll have to forgive me if I call him Dad on here. I'm not trying to be confusing, I'm just going with the flow, and it sounds more natural for me. All right, so. What's going on over at Melotone Kits? Well, kit development continues, and actually, I've got a bit of a funny story to share about that. A few days ago, Dad and I had finally caught up on shipping out kits to you guys, and were able to find some time to get back to development work. He's working on his GU50 monoblocks, and I am working on the headphone amplifier. We had our prototypes in a partial state of completion one night, and the next morning, Dad sent me a message saying we should have a race to get to the first listening test. Well, little did he know he had already lost, and I was having the first listen of my prototype just as he messaged. So that was a quick and easy win. We're continuing to work on them both, and the results so far are exciting. But I'm going to try not to hype them up too much till we really have something to show you. I'd also like to thank everyone who pitched in earlier with ideas of good reference headphones to test with the kit, and for the advice on tuning the frequency response. You know who you are. Okay, so let's clear the deck 
and take a look at what came in recently. Okay, so as Dad has been saying quite a bit recently, we have thousands of tubes on the way. And guess who gets to test and clean most of them? This guy right here. I joke, I love doing this work, but it's a lot of work to clean and test and match these tubes up for you guys. But I love it. It's a lot of fun. And I also get to see all sorts of interesting t stuff too that I can probably show off to all of you. So this week, we actually got in a partial case of these beautiful Svetlana, vintage Svetlana, 6550C power tubes. The 6550C, here, let me see if I can get it better on camera there. There's a logo somewhere. Aha, there it is. The 6550C is a KT88 type power tube made by Svetlana. And we have yet to hear a Svetlana tube that we haven't liked. These tubes sound great, and they have a beautiful warm mid-range that can be lacking in other KT88 tubes, so these are really great sounding. So since we got a partial case of these in, there's going to be some quads available in the store, and we're also going to be uh, having uh, Wilsonton, let me see here, what are we calling it? Yeah, the Svetlana Gold Sets for the Wilsonton R8 will be available again. So they should be in the store right now if you want to go take a look. Now, the one big issue with these 6550C tubes is that there are reproductions and there are fakes and there are copies of them. Now, we're not entirely sure of the uh, history of this guy right here, but we know that it's not a true vintage Svetlana. And the dead giveaway immediately are these punch-outs in the plates. You can see, let's stop using my finger here and use something a little better. You can see the real vintage Svetlana has these rectangular punch outs in their plates. While all the reproductions and fake versions use these circle cutouts. So if you're wondering if a tube is a true vintage one, that is a dead giveaway right away. I don't think we've ever seen a 6550C, an original Svetlana one, that has anything but these rectangular punch-outs. There are other differences, especially if you look closely. The plates are quite a bit different in here. The getterings are different. But you can tell that this tube is made to look very similar to this tube. So even though we're not sure exactly uh, who made this? It could have been a new sensor, or it could have been someone else. What we do know is that this isn't a vintage tube, so you have to watch out for that. They aren't going to sound the same. Okay, so if you stay till the end, let's get these out of the way. If you stay till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. As always, we offer flat rate shipping at $20, and if you order, sorry, if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us, folks, with the only exception to this being our Mellow Tone kits. They're just too heavy to offer that kind of shipping on. Okay, stay safe and have fun. This is Charles from Valves and More, signing off. Cheers, everyone.